Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, and welcome to this uh, site event uh, of the ALPF, HLPF, uh, about transitioning uh, to circular cities, where to focus and why findings from research. My name is Elke de Taille and I'll be your host today or your moderator today. I'll be uh, getting you through this um, webinar. First of all, what are the objectives of this um, webinar? We're going to try to examine the status quo and future ambitions of circular economies transition in Latin America, Chinese and European cities. We will explore how cities uh, from the regions uh, can maximize the full potential of circular economy beyond waste management. We'll also discuss the lessons that cities from the regions can learn from each other and we'll try to facilitate connections among stakeholders from the regions to strengthen, to strengthen existing partnerships and foster new collaborations. First of all, I will tell a bit more about who I am so you know who's um, moderating this session as stated before. I work uh, in Flanders, I work for the Association of uh, City, uh, Flemish Cities and Municipalities. Flanders is a region in Belgium which contains 6.6 .6 million inhabitants. We have around uh, or we have 300 cities and municipalities ranging from 100 inhabitants up to uh, half a million. So there's a big diversity in how big our cities are. Um, we as an association, we uh, are uh, the advocates, the knowledge provider and network developer of uh, local authorities. We try to represent or we represent local um, governments and defend them in numerous policy um, dossiers. Uh, we also uh, support them and strengthen uh, uh, in, uh, with advice, training and publication and communication. And we also try to bring them together in Flanders, but also uh, across other regions with Brussels and Wallonie being the first other ones, but also uh, our Netherlands, uh, people, uh, communities from the Netherlands. And we try to there uh, make sure how or see how we can uh, help them. For a circle economy, what is it exactly that we do? Because uh, although we have very small cities and very big ones, or big for us, um, we uh, try to support them all by uh, supporting them in experiments and projects towards circular cities. Here you have one example on the shared economy where uh, you had one city that really wanted to implement it and then we try to help them with this and also um, exchange this uh, knowledge and implement it in other cities and regions. And there we also wrote a book about that. We wrote a book on how local authorities can become more circular, which um, policy areas they have to work on, etc. And we also try to recognize and eliminate the barriers they have uh, towards working a more cir circular city. So that's what we or, or what I do uh, in Flanders. So that gives you a bit of background so you know that I know what we're talking about today. Um, I will now go through the agenda. We will start, of course, with the uh, welcoming and opening remarks, which I will give to you later. And then we'll get a bit more information on the transition to uh, circular cities and we will uh, know some or hear about some findings from research by FEDRA. Then we'll have two case studies, one from Latin America and one from China. And then we'll also have an interactive discussion with, with uh, people or representatives from all over the world and then some closing remarks. Um, who's here today? <laughs> um, so you have me as a, a moderator, then you have Fedra who's going to give you um, some information about the research she did. Then we will have um, Miss Carolina Urrutia. Urrutia, I will try my best to um, say it all perfectly, Vasquez from the city of Bogota. Then we have Kang Lei who will also give a bit more uh, um, insight in his uh, work or his city study. Um, and then we have also Su Chu, uh, who is joining us here today from ICLE uh, during the panel, and we'll have some closing remarks by Katja Suo. Uh, now a welcome from Veronica Tomei from BMUV, uh, who will be greeting us via video. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good morning, good day, and good evening, wherever you are. I extend a warm welcome to all of you attending this virtual HIPF side event. We will focus on regional perspectives of a transition to circular cities in Latin America, Europe and China. 
Our current resource consumption is unsustainable. The extraction and processing of resources contribute to one third of air pollution, half of global greenhouse gas emissions and 90% of species extinction and water shortages. We need a fundamental shift in how we manage our resources and livelihoods. The concept of the circular economy has therefore gained popularity among political decision makers worldwide as a potential and very powerful solution. A circular economy is a model of consumption and production that aims to minimize waste and maximize the efficient use of resources by keeping products, materials and resources in circulation for as long as possible. Building a circular economy requires a radical transformation of production and consumption patterns to address environmental, economic and social dimensions of sustainability. The circular economy can play a crucial role in addressing the three major crises of our time, climate change, pollution and extinction of sea species. Cities possess a distinct advantage in transitioning to a circular economy as they concentrate resources and can serve as testing grounds for circular solutions. The German Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection is supporting the implementation of numerous initiatives at national and international level that contribute significantly to these issues. Germany was on one of the first countries to introduce a resource efficiency program in 2012, which is named PROGRESS. Its primary objective is to enhance the sustainability of resource extraction and utilization, fulfilling our responsibility to future generations by safeguarding the long-term natural foundations for life. We, therefore, welcome the EU Commission's initiative for sustainable products, presented in March 2022. In 2020 already, the EU adopted the new Circular Economy Action Plan to achieve a circular economy by 2050. The plan goes beyond achieving 100% recycling rates and aims to transform production modes and optimize materials flows. Internationally, Germany is committed to resource efficiency and the circular economy through a broad alliance of countries from all continents germany has actively campaigned for an international plastics agreement recent developments highlight germany's commitment to building strong environmental and climate partnerships germany and colombia have agreed to collaborate closely on climate protection, focusing on environmental protection, biodiversity conservation and sustainable urban development. The German-Chinese environmental partnership is also making significant progress. During this year's German-Chinese intergovernmental consultations, a joint declaration of intent was signed and it was announced that the 7th German-Chinese Environmental Forum would take place in November 2023 under the motto Together for Green and Sustainable Development, Synergy between Tackling Pollution, Biodiversity Loss and Climate Change. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm therefore very pleased 
that we have been able to gather such a diverse group of participants here today, bringing together expertise from a wide range of fields to establish new partnerships and strengthen existing ones. I'm therefore particularly thankful to the Stockholm Environmental Institute to have co-organized this event with us. I'm confident that you will have a stimulated discussion over the next 90 minutes, providing concrete ideas for advancing the circular economy at the international level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for these uh, inspiring open, opening remarks. Um, for the people who are not able to hear or only heard a bit of it, I'm, uh, I will excuse myself. I should have uh, told these housekeeping rules uh, up front because the event is being interpreted. So it's very important to select the language uh, uh, by your choose uh, that or that corresponds to your language uh, being English, Spanish or, Spanish or Chinese, but also to hear the English. Uh, version you had to select English, uh, so my uh, my apologies for that. The recording and presentation slides will be made available afterwards, and uh, during the discussions you can pose your questions to the panelists uh, in the Q and A or F and A section. So, do, uh, do you have any questions during one of the presentations? You can already put them in there. And in case you have any questions or concerns, please reach out uh, to mail at citiesgoingcircular.de. And then um, also to, to contribute, uh, contribute to a diversity sensitive um, webinar or event, we are dedicated to provide an inclusive and harassment free experience to all um, or at all our events. So we celebrate diversity and embrace the opening exchange of ideas among all participation, uh, participations, uh, participants. Participants. Wow, that went a bit wrong. Uh, so thank you for um, for the attention already. And then it's now time uh, for our first speaker of the day, being Fedra van Huyze. She is um, she works at the Stockholm uh, Environmental Institute and is head of Division Society Climate and Policy Support. And she will uh, learn us a bit more about her research findings. So hello, Fedra. Uh, thank you, Elke, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to co-host together with GIZ and BMUV uh, this event on transitioning to circular cities. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. So today I'll tell you a little bit uh, about the research that we have done uh, in Sweden and but also globally around transitioning to circular cities. My name is Fedra, I'm head of Division Societies, Climate and Policy Support at the Stockholm Environment Institute, or SEI in short. And we received funding in 2019 from the Swedish innovation agency Vinova to support cities with becoming more circular. We had uh, multiple objectives, um, but we were also focused quite practically on uh, supporting municipalities with the implementation of circularity. So in a nutshell, our research looked at how we could monitor the circular economy in cities. We looked at how social consequences would manifest itself in cities with the transition to a circular economy. And then we also aimed to build a framework that would support cities with understanding the level of circularity, but also pinpoints to any gaps or opportunities present in the city. Uh, through this three-year uh, research period, we undertook a systematic map of uh, literature uh, done on the circular economy in cities. We looked at uh, frameworks that measure circularity, we looked at indicators, we did a social impact study in a city. And so basically our summary findings are that overall more cities are embarking on circular economy transitions. The reason they do so is because many cities have realized that they cannot continue with the make, take and dispose linear trajectory of resource use at the moment, because cities, uh, as they grow and continue to grow, um, the requirements that they have on materials, but the waste that they produce will also be insurmountable. And so it provides a huge opportunity to close the loop, reduce energy and material footprints. In addition, there's also social pressures in cities 
um, which provide an opportunity for increased circularity. If you look throughout uh, the studies done so far or the academic literature available on circular cities, we see a focus mostly in Europe and China. Uh, somewhat it's starting in Latin America. And if you look at sector and ours, we see mostly a focus on recycling. So the waste management industry and recovery of energy to waste. So in the energy production uh, uh, level. And I will come back to that later. In addition, our research has shown that most cities and policymakers have quite a technocentric view. They think that technology will resolve uh, the material and energy challenges we have, and they see the circular economy as positive for the triple bottom line. For the economy, it will create a lot of GDP uh, and support growth. It's positive for people because they assume there will be a lot of job creation, and it is positive for the planet, with, whereby environmental impacts of the linear economy model will be reduced. However, we noticed also in our research that there was limited consideration of negative consequences of the circular economy. Most of the times, transition processes uh, do come with negative consequences, but they are, I would say, as good as always, unintended. But so it's important to be vigilant to those to ensure that your process is just, that you have the whole society with you and behind you, and that you design a new society where everyone has a place. So I'm thinking, for example, consequences that are often overlooked are rebound effects, where a reduce maybe in material consumption has a spillover effect somewhere else. The quality of jobs is not always high, especially if you look at the waste sector. If you're looking at formalizing informal waste practices, oftentimes people get pushed out, out of the labor market. There's challenges with access to services if we make the sharing economy based on cars, for example, uh, and there's also challenges with the long term financial viability of some of these circular economy initiatives. A lot of them depend on subsidies, especially when it comes to labor for the integration of certain socioeconomic groups. But it's important that we see to integrate DCE initiatives in society uh, longer term. I briefly provide an interactive map. There's a link to this, which you will get when you receive the presentation. And so this is an evidence atlas with research from the last 10 years, 2010 to 2020, related to circular cities. So here we see a concentration in China, in Europe, but we also see now that Latin America is popping up on the radar. And so I'm very happy that we have the city of Bogota here today to talk about uh, their work. Um, so. Looking through the research uh, and the findings, uh, we also then decided to design a framework based on five different components aimed at clarifying the connection between uh, different decisions. So it would be easier for cities, policymakers, but also academia to understand why the circ circular economy was envisioned in a certain way. I will provide two practical examples in a minute of two Swedish cities. But so our five components were the circular economy vision. What does the city put forward as their aim and goals? Uh, in governance and participation, we're looking at who sits at the table in the design of the circular economy plan, in the strategy, in the implementation, but also in the evaluation, whose voice is heard. In the circular strategies here, we look at sectors uh that uh, the strategy can focus on but also at the r's so the r framework is i think most of us know the reuse reduce recycle but there's actually 10 different r's starting from r0 refuse all the way to r9 recover of uh, waste to energy then we have a component urban stocks and flows uh to see how resources flow in a city and then finally our final component is the triple bottom line people, planet and profit, showcasing that the circular economy is not only about the environment, but also impacts on people and impacts on the economy. In more detail here, I will not explain this much, but there's a paper that you can look at. But so this showcases the different uh, more detail on each component of the circular economy and as uh, of our framework. And I said before, you can look at each on its own. But you can also look at some 
of these connected to the others, which allows you to understand why certain decisions were made or why the circular economy uh, was implemented in a certain way. Uh, I will now provide you with the two examples. So first we have the city of Umeå in Sweden. So Umeå is a city in northern Sweden. Uh, they have grown uh, quite extensively in the last decades. They currently have 120,000 citizens, but they plan on doubling in population in the next 30 years or so. They are one of the 112 cities in Europe that are part of the mission for climate neutral and smart cities. So their goal is to reach climate neutrality by 2030 from a territorial perspective, but the city of Umeå also has put forward a consumption-based target where they look at emissions not only generated within their territory, but also at the emissions caused by imports of goods and services. Um, overall, the city of Umeå, they are quite progressive and they are quite uh, um, a front runner when it comes to the circular economy because their aim is to become a leader in the circular economy by 2028. So in their strategy, they have they are quite broad in the participation and the design. It's a lot of government agencies, yes, but they've also engaged quite extensively with industry, with academia, and they are part of a transnational collaboration under the OECD for circular cities. Here we're lacking a little bit the participation of civil society. Uh, because they, they would then also allow to look at the people impact. And so in our framework, we see in the final impact that the, the consideration for people impact is mostly on job creation, but there is very little consideration of other types of so, social impacts like personal rights, participation, political systems and community cohesion. If you look at the sectors uh, and the R's, so they're focusing quite a lot on the second hand shops and uh, they have a circular mall and a free teats banken, which is where you can share uh, sports equipment and hobby equipment. Um, and then their uh, focus on the urban stocks and flows is mostly related to goods and services through the sharing economy. If you then look at the city of Stockholm, their vision is more narrow. So here they focus not on becoming a leader in the circular economy, but they look at it from a material perspective. They want to be resource smart, which then also influences who participates, what sectors do they focus on, but also what urban stocks and flows do they look, on, look at. Um, Stockholm, like Umeå, is also one of the 112 cities that aims to be climate neutral by 2030. And Stockholm actually updated its uh, strategy and they will be climate positive by 2030. Uh, they work mostly through their waste and water company, Stockholm Vatten and Afval, and through their energy company, where they, so basically their circular economy looks at the, the production of biochar, the removal of uh, uh, plastics from the district heating service, and then they have also circular strategies when it comes to the municipality itself, where they look at secondhand and refurbished furniture. But so overall, our recommendations or our next steps for practitioners and even for academia is that we see there's an opportunity to look more at participation or how you can include civil society and citizens in your governance uh, component to ensure that everyone is on board, that it's circular economy for and by the people. Another uh, area of further research is the one when it comes to rights. So including shared ownership, if we're talking about shared mobility service, uh, how can you ensure access to circular services? In addition, there's an opportunity to move beyond the lower R's of recycling and recovery, but going higher to the remanufacturing, repurposing, but even the refusing of consumption. And then a final challenge or area of research that we would like to investigate is also looking at the financial side. There's substantial investments needed in a lot of this infrastructure to make the circular economy function well, but there's also an opportunity to investigate how profitable are these different circular initiatives and how can we support them to ensure that they become an embedded part of the economy. 
There's a little bit more of information on our website. Uh, our project was called Urban Circularity Assessment Framework. So we received funding, fr funding from the Swedish Innovation Agency, Vinova, but we'd be happy to uh, engage with anybody. And we are actually in the process of looking at the city of Bogota and Buenos Aires to see how we can apply our framework uh, in those two contexts, just to understand, is it something that could work in uh, uh, different uh, environments? And are there any lessons that we can learn from there? Thank you. Thank you, Feder, for um, these interesting findings and also um, saying us a bit, telling us a bit more about how cities uh, can implement this or implementing it uh, at the moment. We'll go on with this by um, letting or uh, having two case studies by cities' representatives. Uh, one will be given by Carolina Urrutia. Uh, she is indeed the Secretary of the Environment for the City of Bogota, which we just referred to. In uh, this role, she oversees policy development and implementation, as well as the management of natural resources and uh, key institutions such as the Institute of Animal Welfare and others. And then we will have a second um, case study by Kang Lei. Uh, he is the Vice President President of the Tangying uh, Research Academy of Ecological and Environmental Science. Um, make sure that you have your language settings correct with, because not all speakers will speak in English. So I will first say uh, hello to Carolina or good morning to Carolina. Good morning, Elke, and thank you for the invitation. The sun is shining bright right on my face, so if, if it gets any stronger, I'll get up and, and shut the shutters. Um, it's great to be here. Um, Bogota has received an enormous amount of support, uh, both financial and technical, from the German cooperation, from JZ, and we are not only very thankful, but very much looking forward to have this cooperation, ensure that the work that we've started to do on the circular economy um, moves forward. Our, our period in, in the local government ends in December, and we hope that these policies will continue in time. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, our or circul Bogota Circular is what we call it, Circular Bogota, which is our initiative to start or to sort of, yeah, jumpstart the transition towards a circular economy in Bogota. And um, let me share my screen and put this up in presentation mode. There you are. Okay. Um, so there we are. What are the main pillars for, of, our, of our initiative? Initially, we are looking into a whole systemic model. Uh, of course, we're be beginning to choose the sectors that we are initially focusing on, but we're looking at is the whole system. So what we want is full system efficiency, um, just the way as, as Fedra was describing. We're looking at the idea of circularity to be a principle in terms of how we consume, how we design what we produce, and of course, how we handle waste management. Uh, behind that is the principle of preserving and improving our natural capital, and of course, in general, of optimizing the use of resources. How do we do that, or where do we, where do we start? By looking at consumption, effectually, uh, effectually, how we are going to promote more sustainable forms of consumption. We are, of course, a, uh, a big capital. We're 8 million people a, in a country of 40 million people, and about half of our population li live under poverty standards. Not in absolute poverty, but just in general, in, in, in the description of sort of multidimensional poverty. So we can't um, look at consumption in a very simplified manner. We have to look also at what opportunities can stem from having more sustainable consumption models. We do have to, of course, provide public services, and that's, since it is within the control of, with, of the city, we are very um, intensively looking at how to promote circularity from the public ser service uh, perspective. What are the values behind that? Circularity, of course, sustainability in general, and not to leave behind climate action and the way our, in, our emissions, our mitigation agenda, and our adaptation agenda contribute to circularity and vice versa. 
what are the guiding principles of this transformation? So we're looking at go governance and co-responsibility. Fedor was uh, describing it, I think, very effectively. We not only have to work with the private sector to make sure that there are economic opportunities behind the transition to circular economy, but we have to make sure that these opportunities reach uh, those that are most vulnerable. Like in most of the developing world, we have a huge challenge in terms of who is picking up waste, who is separating waste, and the way in which waste pickers in general and the whole value chain at the bottom of the pyramid of, of waste management is included in our model. Of course, we want to reduce waste, but there, have to be, there also has to be a just transition behind circularity in terms of how people that live off of waste can eventually be effectively including in new production and new uh, consumption schemes. And we've, I think we've started to work very solid, solidly with the private sector. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a few slides. But um, there's a lot we have to do in terms of getting more and more actors from civil society, including in our model. As I was mentioning, one of our principles is that we have to have a systemic vision that integrates all the links in the value chain and not just the initial one. We want to have vertical and horizontal integrality in public policies and our regulatory framework. So we're not working exclusively from the environmental point of view, but as I was mentioning, we're looking into all public service provision and we're working with the economic development sector to see what opportunities we can identify from their perspective, uh, the housing department, which is of course a key piece uh, of uh, promoting uh, new ways to, to produce and consume. And a key part of this looking at systemic vision is that we put forward the city's master land use plan in 2021, and we included circularity as one of our criteria to organize the city's planning. So we have new criteria that demands that all new buildings include spaces to separate waste and, and to have a sort of more effective just spaces in the city to ensure that we can return a, a lot of our waste into new produ production sites. Um, fourth, we are looking at innovation in processes, products, and market and markets, not only from pr the production uh, standpoint, but in every single uh, link of the chain, we want to have innovation be a big part of this systemic transformation. And the fifth part, uh, guiding principle is opportunities. We're looking for circular opportunities that increase private sector productivity and competitiveness, not looking at the private sector only from the standpoint of the huge corporations, but every single link that is looking to be more productive and is looking for no uh, economic opportunities. So uh, I think this graphic kind of uh, summarizes it very well. We want to have um, we have to, we want to have impact on the extraction of natural resources. We're looking at innovation and social, institutional, and organizational changes as the only means to really uh, effectively transform every link of the chain. And we're looking to support processes from production and pro process and product design to manufacture, distribution, trade and services, responsible consumption and waste recovery. We did start working, to be honest, because we are a developing economy, we did start working from the waste reco recovery perspective. But in Bogota also, there's a very interesting thing, which is that the, the environment sector doesn't really look at service provision for the whole of the waste and and the, the cleaning of the city services that's in a different uh, sector so we managed to work together and to have the environment sector and our secretariat work a little more on circularity from the full systemic perspective because when you're having to provide goods and services every day and um, the urgent displaces the the important policy measures all the time. So we're able to work uh, on two different tracks, um, but together between both sectors. What challenges have we identified? I think the same challenges that most cities have. We have linear processes in the production and consumption of goods and services. That's just the way we've been thinking about things for very, very long. Uh, culturally, we have a prevalence of very unsustainable habits uh, that are tough to break. So we have to work on um, behavioral changes as much as we have to work 
on more the, the more technical issues of consumption and production. We have very low levels of reuse. I mean, I, it is very low, around 17 or 18 percent in, 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 of recycling in general, and that stems from the use and differentiated treatments of waste. That comes a lot from the fact um, that people don't see that separating or differentiating treatment of waste is really effective because we're still burying most of our waste every day. We don't have a selective processes of collection of waste and that's a key. People want to separate and they want to have different differentiated treatments, but they're not seeing that they're, it's actually that effective. And we have to make sure that when we offer public services, um, people can actually see the impact of the effort that they'll put into differentiated treatments. We have a lot of disarticulation, this, this articulation between all the actors in the public and private sectors. The inefficiency of our regulatory framework comes from decisions that were made 10 or 15 years ago and that have a lot to do with how the city works operationally with its waste collecting services because they've been contracted to it collect waste and get paid by the weight of that waste and and as long as we don't have a, a differentiated tariff scheme where people can actually get discounts when they correctly uh, separate their waste and if they don't see that the trucks that are actually picking up their waste uh, have differentiated treatments between what's going to recycling or what's going um, to organic waste treatment and what's getting you know buried in our landfill they have to see that uh, difference before they start to effectually changing their behaviors so that's what we're prioritizing our work on and one of the one of our or, or possibly i think what what we're leaving that is the most important legacy is that we're not thinking about this only from the perspective of environmental issues uh, we're looking at a multi-sectoral approach that includes the private sector and that includes civil society and um, so what we're working on is research innovation and market development that impacts regulations and public policy providing a solid structure in terms of data management and knowledge, and of course, looking into governance structures that remain uh, in the future. Who's working on it? Uh, the environment sector, the, de the economic development sector, and the housing and public service sector. Who are we working with beyond public institutions? We're working with providers of our water and waste management um, companies, from the energy provision, and of course, with a private sector, with our Chamber of Commerce, the organizations that they have around waste management, our industrial um, organizations, and WWF, amongst others. We have a committee that meets almost on a monthly basis with a lot of support, as I said, from JGZ. Uh, and what we've been doing is identifying those innovative initial sectors that we can work with in order to sort of prove that this can be successful that we can work with, with with the private and the public sectors to promote circularity the first accelerator project that we identified was an issue that hadn't had much work done and when the, where there was sort of a lot of thirst for innovation and a lot of of thirst for for feeling that a change could be done and that's our circular fashion network, uh, where we've been working with the private sector on eco design, on including repair in the value change, on improving the modes and habits of consumption, and of recovering materials. Uh, we've been working with designers and repairers uh, on um, improving their knowledge of circular fashion and how that can work and posing innovation challenges to the academic sector so universities and academic institutions can also put forward their proposals. On repair, repair we've been working on aligning institutional support from different sectors, uh, strengthening the capacities of those who repair clothes and developing business models from design and repair that they can work together and have better economic opportunities for both links of the chain. Um, we worked, it, it's by far the most glamorous of our events every year. We've been presenting in Bogotá's Fashion Week, looking into circularity as an option that can be 
taking into account both from the designer's point of view and from the consumer's point of view. And we've had two sustainable fashion trade expos so far. They've been hugely su successful and we hope to scale them up in the future. We also have a recovery scheme. We've recovered more than, I forget the number right now, but I think we're around five tons of clothes that we've um, recovered over the past year and we've uh, worked with organizations that are actually including them into new production schemes. What are we going to do next? We have the approval of our public policy on circular economy, hopefully in August. We've been working with all our partners in developing a, a single policy that joins together all these pieces. In Bogota we have um, an economic policy committee that has to approve all, all our policies and that's the way we ensure that they have long-term impact a government to government. Second, we're looking to regulatory improvement across the board. We've been doing a lot of lobbying and having a lot of conversations to improve the national regulation uh, on tariff and waste scheme uh, definitions and of course at our city level as well, including construction and demolition waste. We have a huge issue with our waste from construction and demolition, and we're trying to tighten up the regulation so that they, we make sure that most of those uh, residues from building usually get included into no, no uh, development of, of buildings. Third, governance, we're consolidate, consolidating Bogotá Circular as a platform for public-private academic and international cooperation. And of course, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have to keep working on differential approaches to population and territory in the transition to circularity, including more actors from the civil society and having I think in terms of, of, of waste pickers across the board, there's a lot of fear that looking into circularity is going to take away their livelihoods. And so naturally, uh, there's a lot of rejection when we put forward um, this, this work that we're doing, but we have to make sure that waste pickers know that we're not looking to eliminate their sources of, of, of income and their livelihoods, but to actually uh, improve their economic opportunities. That's a very quick look into what we're doing in Bogota. Uh, we look forward to any uh, consultations or questions that may come from panelists and participants. And again, we're very happy to be here and also to work so well with the German cooperation. And we look forward to continuing this work in the future. Thank you, uh, Carolina. That was very interesting. I saw a lot of similarities uh, with with the Flanders work, uh, although the context is completely different. So it's very interesting to learn uh, from each other. Then I will now uh, give the floor to Kang Le, um, if he's able to connect. Uh, hello or good evening, uh, Kang Le.
Thank you for wrapping up so uh, quickly. Again, it was a very interesting presentation, so that was not the issue, of course. And uh, I would now uh, like to go on further to uh, the panel discussion. And therefore, I would like to um, uh, say hi to a new um, speaker of today, Mr. Zhu Chu. Uh, Zhu, uh, Mr. Chu has an extensive experience in sustainable development and regional cooperation. So I was wondering if uh, Mr. Sue, you can tell me a bit more how cities and regions in China and beyond can create partnerships to maximize the potential of urban circular economy transitions and what are the benefits of collaborating across regions in terms of knowledge uh, and sharing and innovation, of course. Um, could you tell me a bit more about that, please? Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for the opportunity to join this very uh, inspiring discussion. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Kang Lee just introduced uh, a very good example of uh, Chinese city Tianjin's practices on promoting circular economy. But from a overall national perspective, I see that Chinese government has been putting priority on the circular transition and also uh, under the uh, national goal of climate neutrality, or uh, we call it a dual carbon goal to peak the carbon emission by 2030 and also uh, realize uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, we see from many of the national policies and strategies that mention in the connection between circular economy towards the climate uh, uh, goal, and also under another uh, national strategy of realizing or promoting ecological uh, civilization to support the transformation of a sustainable economic growth and structure. So multi-level policies have been taken to promote circular economy, including those at the local and the subnational uh, level. For, uh, for, for instance, China has launched a pilot program to promote so-called zero waste cities, you know, to uh, uh, promote the local government action to reduce the, the urban solid waste, um, and also uh, promoting green factories and also uh, uh, circular uh, industrial uh, zones, you know, in, in the past years, all this have been uh, generating uh, uh, major impacts, you know, on the result of reducing uh, uh, and cutting carbon emission and also the total volume of waste. So uh, in the recent uh, uh, four, 15th, of, uh, 14th of five years plan, a circular economy also being mentioned as one of the priority sector and also instruments, you know, to realize China's overall social, economic uh, uh, and environmental management and development. So, uh, however, from the city level, we see also some of the issues and also gaps uh, are there. Uh, for instance, at the local level, uh, for example, many of the ICLE members and also partner cities, or when we are discussing with them about circular economy in cities or circular cities, they only think of uh, urban solid waste management. I think this is also something mentioned by our uh, colleague from uh, Stockholm Environment Institute, you know. They still stick to the three R policies, but not uh, have an extended understanding about the relations between circular economy with the climate change, with the biodiversity, with the transition of food and uh, agricultural system, uh, et cetera, you know. So it's a very traditional understanding about circular economy. That's also, the management and implementation of circular uh, actions are within very specific, uh, narrowly defined department work, not how bring in this work on the table uh, of promoting collaboration and synergy between different departments who are related to the circular transition. You know, for example, having an integrated uh, strategy at the local level to connect the circular economy promotion with the uh, urban planning with the uh, transportation, with the uh, climate, in, in, you know, uh, adaptation and the mitigation, of course, and also uh, biodiversity and agriculture uh, sectors. Um, ICLA has been doing a, a number of uh, projects uh, in relations with the Chinese cities' engagement. For example, we are promoting the green public procurement. This is also another perspective has been uh, not uh, emphasized by Chinese cities so far. But in European context, EU has been promoting the green public procurement, not only uh, 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 with the, within the, uh, the, the Europe, but also many of the European cities have been uh, 
uh, putting this as one of the local priority policies. You know, we are also supporting the Commission to produce a green public procurement guide for the for the European uh, cities. However, this has been just started in China. We have conducted many workshops to help build the awareness to Chinese local leaders on the importance of green public procurement as a as a as a driver and also instrument to promote circular uh, transition. And also we are implementing projects in relations uh, in the sector of textile and also food sector, you know, providing also research report and case studies from Europe and other part of the world for Chinese local leaders to consider. As I said, China has put in much effort on the uh, industrial sector in terms of circular transition, but less on the public awareness building on the behavior change of the uh, consumption and also on the, uh, using a green public procurement as an instrument as such. So we have been uh, uh, working in these areas that are not being uh, uh, paid much uh, attention to help the cities to, to get the, the opportunity to uh, learn from uh, Europe and other part of the world and also build partnership for extent. For example, we uh, have established a so-called Green Circular Cities Coalition between three Chinese cities with the city of Bonn, Tuku from Finland, and also uh, Yokohama uh, and uh, Kitakushu from Japan to help them to have a, a regular learning and knowledge sharing uh, platform. So lastly, we think that uh, uh, a lot of potential could be uh, uh, helping to drive the circular city actions and transition uh, with the Chinese uh, participation uh, by providing more capacity building uh, opportunities to link the uh, Chinese cities with, uh, with, uh, with the cities from other part of the world, but also how to uh, uh, apply the research outcome to the local policy uh, making to bring this uh, uh, cutting edge research outcome and theories to the local leadership. For example, how for them to understand an extended concept of circular cities, you know, from 3R to 10R or even more in the future. And also uh, what is relations between circular city development with the climate actions, with the uh, economic goals and also transitions, you know, and more, uh, also one of the most important uh, uh, thing is that how to uh, build a synergy between different uh, department and policy and sectors, you know, uh, under the overall growth of, uh, of, uh, of a circular and environment uh, uh, governance. I think these are a lot of uh, um, topics that we may work together with the GIZ, also with the colleagues and cities from all over the world to help also engage Chinese cities. Thank you very much. Thank you as well for this uh, extensive answer. I think you mentioned a lot of very uh, interesting uh, points, for example, the synergies or the importance of it, and also working to or to gather uh, of different departments, uh, an issue we here in Flanders or in Belgium or in Europe are also uh, known for uh, or known with. Uh, then I have a question for Carolina. Um, how can uh, cities ensure that a just and inclusive transition while implementing circular economies strategies and um, how can civil society be involved to uh, ensure that no one is uh, left behind in this process? I would like to hear a bit more from your uh, perspective or your context about this. I think that's actually the greatest challenge in terms of just transition in general, because I think um, the traditional consultation processes, meetings where we present policies and get comments, aren't being effective enough. Um, so what does it mean to actually collectively build circularity policies? I think a lot of it has to do, um, and it, it's sometimes difficult to, found the bounder, to find the boundaries between the responsibilities of solely the public sector and the private sector. And I think that's why Circular Bogota is an interesting um, initiative because giving the public sector and the civil society organizations even though they're not grassroots since they're an active part of the platform and can actually um build policies with us it's in their interest as well that we don't have only traditional consultation processes but actually look at um, civil society organizations and the smaller links of the productive sector and waste pickers everybody across the board gets to put some serious thought into how they want to be included 
uh, not only looking at documents as policy papers, but looking at the value chain as a process that includes all sectors of society. So I think, and that honestly, sometimes that goes beyond the capacity of local governments. We don't have the time or the resources to go into that level of detail. Whereas the private sector and NGOs such as WWF, and in our case, SEMPRE, which is an, a foundation funded by the industries, and the productive sector, they want these policies to be effective. So we can collaborate on having um, sort of mixed roles in terms of inclusiveness that are more effective than the traditional, you know, let's have a meeting and I'll listen to what your concerns are when that is actually not usually as effective. But I do think that's an issue with all climate change policies and with all of the just transition. It's not, it's a matter of going beyond the way we usually look at participation and looking into collaborative building of policies. I don't have the complete answer. I just think there's a lot more time and resources that have to be put into the process when we want policies that are actually inclusive. And that has to be something that um, decision makers know from the beginning. If you want to have a good policy that's sort of technically robust, you can just use a couple of weeks and, and have a regular participation process. If you want a collaborative development of a policy, you're going to need a year or two, and that's the way it works. And even if we have this dead sense of urgency that we have to put policies forward very quickly, effective participation takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Okay, if I might uh, compliment what Carolina say, said, I think you made really good points around the participation. It's something that we see also in Europe. If we do uh, transition processes and we ask for participation, it's always the same groups that join into the discussion and debate and so that feed into the policy process. So what we're trying to we try to do with uh, our research on circular cities. So we, we carried out a social impact study looking across eight different categories of social impacts to assess in which way are people positively or negatively impacted by circularity and that also then allows to understand the social acceptability of your different studies looking at for example you see it often with uh, decarbonization and renewable energy projects with the nimby not in my backyards uh, wind turbines and solar panels etc so we're doing something similar for the circular economy so if you talk around uh, how will it impact people i think that's a really good point that you made around the boundaries, public, private sector, and how to improve consultation processes. Thank you for this uh, addition to Carolina's answer. I think it was a good, uh, good addition to it. And then I have a, a question for Mr. Uh, Lei. What are the future goals of, the, of cities like Tianjin uh, in China for transition to, um, tr transitioning to an urban circular economy? And what are the next steps or priorities in advancing circularity within the urban context? Maybe you were planning to say it, but we didn't have the time for it. Sorry.
Well, thank you for this uh, very um, straightforward and very um, compact, uh, but very clear answer. Um, I see we have a bit more time, so if it's okay, I would like to ask another question to Mr. Shu. Um, what are the main enablers to accelerate the circular economy transition? Uh, thank you. As we heard also from other uh, colleagues, I think uh, top down and uh, the combination of top down and bottom up policy framework should be created for the future promotion of circular transition uh, in cities. You know, um, particularly in China now, the, uh, our government is updating our circular economy promotion law, which was made in uh, two thousand eight. You know. Um, by that time, I think the understanding and the definition of circular economy was quite limited and narrow, as I just mentioned. So we should now introduce some new perspective as connected with the climate target and also, of course, the, the Chinese national commitment to, by dual carbon goal, as well as other targets, for example, the biodiversity global target and also the national strategy as such. Uh, uh, also introducing, for example, a whole a life cycle principle into uh, say green design and also production, but not only look at the recycling side, you know, and also waste management. Uh, reinforce, for example, extended uh, producer responsibility in assessment of the private sector performance in in the in, in the whole value chain. But also another very important enabler is the technological innovation, you know. Uh, how to create an environment uh, uh, for the government to, to stimulate the market and also the private sector, particularly to drive ex uh, uh, the, the reform and the transition. Uh, for instance, in China, the, in, uh, the promotion of uh, electric vehicles in cities, as, as you can see from many mega cities like Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, you know, uh, we are making a major progress in the promotion of EVs, you know, comparing with many other big cities in the world. For example, in, 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 in Shenzhen, we have uh, now uh, nearly uh, 860,000 EVs running in the street, you know, just uh, by the past 10 years. It's, it's almost uh, more than 20%, I think, of the total number of cars in Shenzhen. Uh, there is a target, uh, I think, uh, within 10 years, uh, probably majority, more than 80% of the Cars in Shenzhen will be electric. You know, uh, the Shenzhen also is the is the is the base of BYD, one of the the leading uh, producer, of course. I actually, uh, taking this example, I, I just want to say that the government has uh, been working closely with the private sector to create a favorable environment. You know, by providing, of course, also a lot of financial support to drive the technological innovation. That is another topic uh, and the enabler about the money. You know, you need the resources, you need the funding, but not necessarily only provided by the, the national or municipal government. You have to create a very good business model to uh, engage with the private sector. For example, uh, to promote the transition in mobility sector is not only about uh, producing and buy, buying the electric cars, but also uh, deploying the whole charging system, you know, that is more expensive than the car and vehicles themselves. So, so I think Shenzhen and Beijing all are doing well uh, through the ten, uh, through through the past uh, years of efforts. Lastly, uh, one most important uh, point uh, enabler is the enhancing of awareness and understanding of the public that can lead to the change of the public's behavior. You know, In China, this is a very important point. When we are promoting the so-called zero waste cities, and one of the important uh, priority is the reduction of food and kitchen waste. You know, We have been famous, a famous country for our hospitality, but also very famous for wasting food on our table. You know? uh, as, as you have been uh, visiting China, uh, uh, you, you know that, you know, that is really bad. You know? So how to promote this change of perception and understanding of the public then to the leading to the change of behavior you know, uh, in, in, in the kitchen and food waste. Uh, and also change the perception of urbanization back into the topic about the mobility system. I think the, the most important is for people to change the behavior of buying and driving private car, you know, comparing taking a more sustainable, ecological friendly, mobility, you know, walking, cycling, you know, this is also a mainstream in Europe and in many other countries. We are, we're getting back to our uh, uh, past, being famous for a bicycle city uh, uh, as a Beijing, as a song just uh, said that. Uh, lastly, I think uh, also for the local governments, we need to identify some priority sectors. For example, 
in building sector, in, in textile uh, sector, in the food waste management. But more importantly, to bring the department working together because we are lack of data, you know, so far. When we are making a policy at the local level, each department has a part of the data. There is no a, a complete data set for policy making. I think this is very important, you know, to bring them together to build synergy and also building a shared data system uh, for the uh, circular policy uh, making. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, the answer. Before we go to the closing remarks by Katja Sur, I would like to ask um, all uh, panel members one last question. For the people who have uh, asked a question in the Q&A, they have been answered by the experts and the presentations will also be shared um, afterwards, just so you know. So my final question, and I will first ask it to Fedra. Um, what uh, lessons can Latin America, Chinese and European uh, cities draw from each other's experience in transitioning to a circular economy and uh, please try to give your answer very briefly and concise. Yes, so uh, thank you so much Alka and so my response to this would be uh, what can everyone learn from one another is that we're all connected so it doesn't really matter where you utilize the resource or the energy we are a global society whatever gets produced or consumed has an effect on a global scale. And so one of the examples is in Sweden, if you look at climate neutrality from a territorial perspective, just move all your industry outside of your border and you're climate neutral. That is not how we want to go. We want to look at consumption-based emissions, ensuring that you consider import, export, and also geopolitical stability. Importantly, it's also not only about climate neutrality and mitigation, but also adaptation, biodiversity, as Zushu referred to, also soil quality and so on and so forth. Very important system perspective, basically. Uh, thank you for this uh, concise answer. Maybe uh, Carolina or Kang Lei want to add to this. Uh, I will give you the floor before I go to Katya. I think, Alka, even though I completely agree with the systemic perspective and the systemic as wide as you can get, you have to choose how to start. So how do you eat an elephant? You have to cut it up in little pieces. Otherwise, huge policies are impossible to implement. So I'd compliment Fedra with saying yes, we need to have a full systemic approach to thinking about these issues, but then you have to sort of decide what, how you're going to start and how it, you can scale it up eventually. Thank you for this very good addition. Uh, Mr. Kang Lei, do you have uh, some closing uh, answer to this or um, do we go to Katya? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then I will now uh, give the floor to, to Katja, as said before, for the closing remarks. She is the head of, of the Circle Economy team at GIC, uh, where she focuses on developing concepts and pilot projects to promote a stronger and circular economy in emerging and developing countries. So, Katja, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elke, and thank you very much for all the panelists. Um, it, it is a very hard job to do now in five minutes to sort of do some closing remarks. But I just want to give you some reflection on what I took with me. And um, I found really interesting some key words in the various presentations, like Fedra was mentioning the importance of looking beyond the city borders. So you just re or said it again, it's really important to look at consumption patterns, not just uh, um, at the resources. So Carolina, uh, Carolina from Bogota, um, I found very interesting that you said the innovation is key. And so innovation uh, is, is key for the systemic change. And uh, I think one very good example at the uh, uh, Bogota level is the Circular Economy Lab, it's a Laboratoria de Economia Circular in Bogota, no? where um, enterprises can come together and test products, processes, uh, uh, and also their business models. So, so this I found really interesting there. Um, Kang, I found really interesting the, that you said there must be a benefit. People must feel the benefit uh, from circular economy uh, measures and also that there needs to be a regulation, which I found uh, which I find also is key. Uh, so you said uh, green public procurement, I think this is for, on the city level, it's uh, 
the most influential level be, besides regulation. Yeah? One thing that I was missing a bit was that nobody mentioned uh, the effect of prices. I think we can all do a lot in terms of awareness raising, trying to change cons uh, consumers' patterns. But I think without changes in prices and without real prices being put on the on the price tax, uh, we will not get very far. So this is a very important thing. And I know you can't do it on the uh, municipal, uh, municipal level alone. There must be a link in, uh, between national policies, ex extended producers, responsibility policies and so on. But I think some cities can also try their own pricing schemes. There is one example that just went through the court in Germany, one smaller town in uh, like 300,000 uh, uh, inhabitants in Germany, they introduced a tax on uh, single-use packaging for gastronomy. and. Uh, I mean, industry was fighting against it, but in the end, the city of Tübingen won, and now they are having 50, 50 cents, euro cent uh, on single-use packaging and 20 cent on single-use cutlery, for example. So I think there can be some pricing schemes that could be tried out and tested uh, on a municipal level as well. So, and just give me two more seconds, uh, because we have, as you said, we also have a Circular City Labs project which uh, tries and, and sees how we can test deposit and reuse schemes in five cities around the world. So if you are interested in that one, get in touch. And we also have the Prevent Waste Alliance. I think Jonathan put it in the chat, which is a multi-stakeholder partnership of more than 500 um, participants. I, so some of you know it already with very practical solutions so we can all learn from each other and not reinvent the wheel. So thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity for these closing remarks. I hope it was brief enough. Okay, back to you. Yeah, I think it was a, a very uh, brief but uh, clear um, closing remarks. Very interesting to have the wrap up and to also have the addition of the importance of pricing. Um, so thank you very much for for those uh, closing remarks. And then I would like to thank all people who have uh, followed this webinar. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. I learned a lot. I saw a lot of uh, similarities with what we are doing, but also some uh, some opportunities or some work that I didn't know yet and that could be very interesting for us uh, here in Flanders or even uh, in Europe. So thank you very much. Have a nice day or evening uh, or good night, <laughs> depending on where you are at the moment. So thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.